Throwing stuffed animals out a window lets rescuers know there's someone in the building. One of many lessons children learn at the Survive Alive house. Fire simulation lighting and non-toxic smoke help to make it a realistic fire experience. The visit begins with a discussion on safety. These second grade children are from St. Sebastian's. They are among some 26,000 kids who will visit the Survive Alive house or mobile units this year. Matches. Are they good or bad? Bad. Yeah. Bad? So, so we're saying, what about lighting your birthday candles? So they're good, right? So they have some good and bad uses. In preparation for their visit, children receive fire safety instruction in their classrooms. Then firefighters reinforce such things as having an escape plan, to feel the door before opening it, not to hide, and as always, the importance of smoke detectors. That's a steady beat. Right? That means there's a fire. That means there's smoke in your house. When it just chirps, beep, that means that you need to change the battery. Change the, battery. the children are told not to be afraid of what can be a scary looking firefighter in full gear. A demonstration of what they wear is included to ease those fears. This is what a firefighter will look like. They have to come to your house. The classroom portion of the visit is reinforced with a hands-on practical experience within the Survive Alive house. And if you were trapped in your bedroom and there was a fire, and for whatever reason it took a firefighter in a while to rescue you, this could save your life because you could go down this just like a regular ladder. So the first thing we're going to do is you're going to go in the bedrooms in groups of probably three or four to each bedroom, and there's two bedrooms. And you're going to lay on the bed and pretend to be asleep because most fires happen at night when you are asleep. You could have smoke almost all the way down to the bed, so you don't even want to sit up in bed if you hear the smoke alarm going off, because you could get your head right in the smoke. And smoke has all sorts of chemicals in it, which can be very bad for you, and it can also be extremely hot and burn your insides when you breathe it in. So you want to stay away from smoke as much as you possibly can, okay? It's going to make a little noise. You're going to see the smoke go across the ceiling, the smoke detector is going to go off. When it goes off, we're going to roll out of bed. The Survive Alive House is operated jointly by the Milwaukee Fire Department and Milwaukee Public Schools. Is it working? In the last two years, we have not had a fire fatality in our target age group of 7 to 12. We just had a little girl come in last week that had a fire. She was very scared, but now that she came through the house, she understands what's going on. We have a lot of people that tell us stories of their houses being on fire. They understand what to do. The teachers do a great job with the Learn Not to Burn curriculum before they get here, and they spend about an hour and a half within our program. They come in second grade and they come in fifth. The reason we use second and fifth is that's the most fatalities that we had when they first started the program. Once the children have escaped and gone to their meeting place, one student makes a call to 911. My house is on fire. What's your address? Is everybody out of your home? No. How many people are trapped? One. I absolutely love it. I never really understood what the Survive Live House was until I started volunteering, and I can just see a drastic change in our fire fatalities and the children that we have coming through. The Survive Live House gets much of its funding from fundraisers and private grants. It's open to schools, community groups, and agencies. Firefighters, 
NPS staff and volunteers assist in the program's operations. We have firefighters that come in, but we also have civilian volunteers that come in. We have uh, a couple that have been here for 10 years. We can always use more civilian volunteers, and I think once they get here, they really enjoy the program. Fire officials say the reduction in fire fatalities among children shows that the first 10 years of this educational effort have made a difference. And they continue to emphasize that 250,000 kids have learned about fire safety from a program started only 10 years ago. I never envisioned this 10 years ago, especially being involved in the fires and actually seeing the fatalities with children and now watching them go through it and hopefully we'll never have another fatality. I-43 is a popular roadway carrying up to 150,000 vehicles a day. That's brought about the need for resurfacing, bridge repairs and ramp improvements on two segments of the highway from March to October. So the Wisconsin Department of Transportation has launched a public awareness campaign to help meet the challenges of I-43 construction. It's getting to be that time of year again. As construction season nears, it's time to think again about your travel options. Starting April 5th, there will be full-time lane and ramp closures on nearly five miles of Interstate 43 and significant restrictions on another three and a half miles as the Wisconsin Department of Transportation repairs the freeway. The work for I-43 in 2002 is going to be very similar to what we've done the last two years on U.S. Highway 45 and previous to that on I-94. That is, we're going to go out there and restore the driving surface, repave the roadway, if you will. We're also going to make improvements to the ramps, both on and off, and also we're going to make repairs to the bridges. The work coming up will go from the Mitchell Interchange up to um, National Avenue and from North Avenue up to Lexington. On the southern segment from the Mitchell up to National, we will be closing one lane during the day and then closing a second lane at night. The benefits will be um better driving conditions. We're allowing for more capacity on the ramps when it's metered to allow more traffic on, less congestion, less backup on the on-ramps, in addition to the better driving surfaces on the freeway. So the, the public will see the improvements. Before we can have an improved I-43, we all need to work together to get through the construction. This project will pose more challenges for drivers because both the north and southbound lanes will be repaired in one construction season. To help ensure that the community stays open and mobile, the project will finish in stages. After May 24th, three lanes in both directions will be open during peak hours between North Avenue and Lexington Boulevard. The freeway between Oklahoma and National Avenues, including northbound on-ramps at Holt and Howard Avenues, will be fully open during peak hours by June 27th. By August 16th, three lanes will be open in both directions between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. from the Mitchell Interchange to National Avenue and from North Avenue to Lexington Boulevard. All work from the Mitchell Interchange to National Avenue will be finished by August 30th. All work from North Avenue to Lexington will be finished by October 15th. Freeway congestion means many drivers will be heading for city streets and there will be an impact. But city officials say they have now had a lot of experience with freeway projects and they believe they're ready to handle any diversions. We've been working with the DOT for oh, about um, 12 years now on, on these type of efforts. Uh, it started out actually on, on a South I-43 job back in about 88 when, when they resurfaced that uh, section of freeway the last time. So we've got some good experience here on, on a, how to handle the traffic that does divert off the freeway. The State Department of Transportation predicts the project will reduce freeway capacity by one-third during peak travel hours. And the DOT hopes for a 40 percent reduction in the number of vehicles using the corridor to reduce congestion. It's probably desirable um, from a construction standpoint. Uh, it makes the work uh, run a little easier. but. Um, it's probably not necessary. Majority of the work is going to be done at night. And so by doing most of the work at night, I don't know that it's truly a 40% diversion. Uh, you're not going to affect as many drivers during the nighttime hours. 
to reduce freeway congestion, manage traffic flow, and advise drivers of delays and ramp closures, the state operates a program called Monitor. It includes closed-circuit television cameras and overhead message signs. The Sheriff's Department will again be deploying special enhanced freeway patrols. Additional crash investigation sites have been built for drivers who are able to move their vehicles. Milwaukee is beefing up police and crossing guard patrols. There will be some minor adjustments to traffic lights on surface streets parallel to the freeway. We may do some, uh, do some signing and things out on the, uh, in some hot spots, but um, we also work hand in hand with the Milwaukee Police Department and the Safety Commission. Probably have about eight more patrols on the streets during the peak periods, uh, morning and afternoon peak travel times when we would expect uh, the most diversion to occur if, if we do get a lot of diversion. There's a variety of alternate routes and uh, you'll notice that we don't, we don't post any detour routes per se or we don't come out and suggest everybody take 27th Street because uh, that would really cause a havoc on the system. We will monitor it the first week or so and that's when you have the most problem, when people start looking for that route, that best route to get, get downtown. Um, after that it seems to even out and, and we, we can handle it quite easily. As in past freeway projects, state money pays for the city's response. So they do pay 100% of these extraordinary um, activities that we undertake. They, they'll pay for the police enforcement. They are paying for the crossing guards. There'll be some safety flyers that'll be put out to schools. They're paying for whatever work we have to do on the uh, signal timing. And if we have to put any additional signage, signage up. Uh, so it's working out pretty well for us and I think it's a valuable part of the project. Thousands of general information brochures have been published with advice for dealing with the project. Use an alternate route. Avoid I-43 during rush hour. For ride sharing, call 800-455-POOL. Freeway flyer or other transit information, 414-344-6711. I guess uh, watch the news, watch the newspapers, watch for announcements as th these projects are all done. The Charles Alice Art Museum is housed in this Tudor-style mansion, completed in 1911. Built specifically as a combination home and museum, the local historic landmark houses a collection of art that spans 2,000 years. The Alice name, of course, is um, very important in the history of Milwaukee. Charles Alice started the Alice Chalmers Manufacturing Company, um, employed many, many people for, for many years in the city, helped build Milwaukee into one of the industrial giants in the Midwest. He and his wife built this home and furnished it with the intent purpose of it becoming a museum. Uh, they intended to gift it to the citizens of Milwaukee. Part of the will of Mrs. Alice was that none of the collection can be subtracted from or added to. Charles Alice amassed the collection of fine art with his wife Sarah for over 40 years. The mansion, collections, and original furnishings were donated to the public in 1947. This is the marble hallway. Um, all the marble you see in the hallway was imported from Italy. Um, the ceiling is a uh, Italian plaster. Uh, all the workforce was also imported to install it. In addition to the, uh, all the marble that you see, uh, we have the most uh, Korean, Chinese, and Japanese pieces in this space. Of note are these uh, Netskis over here. Very uh, beautiful, small, decorative pieces. Somewhat unique in that um, they, it's kind of a dying art form. We have two extraordinary paintings, two of the largest paintings in the collection right on either side of the uh, entrance to the uh, French parlor. They are attributed to Lucas Krennic the Elder and they are from the 1500s. He was um, contemporary of Martin Luther. They have the original wood frames and the gold wash. Extremely, extremely lucky to have them. I don't know how Mr. Alice came by him, but I'm sure most museums in the world would like to have them. So as a small museum, I think they may be two of our most prized pieces. There's a, a vase, it's Satsuma pottery, and the uh, piece you'll see has a thousand hand-painted faces, all different. Uh, we have a magnifying glass that will help you to discover those faces. And there's a small bowl to its right that has uh, 3,000 butterflies. A little harder to see the butterflies, but uh, once again, uh, an incredible piece. 
it's more of a museum space, the way uh, we're displaying the works. But it would have been, uh, you'd have really felt that it was lived in as you walked in here when the Alice's lived here. You are now in what we call the French parlor. It was their living space, and it's probably the most lavish room in the house. It's uh, known for its French furniture, Louis XIV, 15th, 15th, and 16th pieces, uh, the French Barbizon painters. This is a great example of they knew that they were going to will this home to the community because they have a built-in cabinet right here to display the Barry pieces, the, uh, the beautiful bronzes. You are now in the uh, library. You can see as the, uh, the cabinets uh, with some of Charles' original books and uh, novels. This is a, a unique room. It's also called the American Room at times. All American paintings by the uh, Hudson River School painters. Most well known would be uh, George Innes. Um, so we have a few of his pieces, Ralph uh, Blakelock. A lot of people walk into this room and are surprised that we have such famous painters and such wonderful works of theirs. In addition to that, you'll find the uh, very unique uh, wall covering. It's actually a uh, wallpaper made to resemble embossed Spanish leather, and it is a uh, Lincrusta Walton. It's wallpaper still made in London. We are now in the Alice's dining room. First thing to uh, really point out that is oftentimes overlooked is once again we find the Lincrusta Walton wallpaper in this room. Uh, in addition to that, you'll notice uh, there's a lot of a lot of silver in this room, silver-plated sconces, silver-plated chandelier, as opposed to the gold that you tend to find throughout the uh, French parlor. And on the table, uh, a very, very uh, delicate piece of Venetian lace, uh, very old, all handcrafted. And uh, two pieces that are really extraordinary in this uh, room are the uh, large pottery piece over there with a bold blue crest. It's uh, Satsuma pottery, once again and we're told that it's one of the best preserved and largest pieces still existing in the world today. Uh, in addition to that, you'll find a piece right over here. It's a, a Japanese teakwood screen. It has the uh, 12 calendar, the 12 months of the year, all represented by different flowers. The Maplewood Butler's Pantry now leads to what was once the home's coach house and a new addition, completed in 1998. Uh, a substantial part of the building was added on to a great hall was added a few years ago with a great deal of support uh, for many foundations and individuals here in Milwaukee. It blends perfectly in with the rest of the building. We use it for additional exhibit space, for traveling art shows, and also it can be rented out for various activities. As you're moving up the uh, staircase, don't forget to look to your right uh, on the first landing. You're going to find a piece by Thomas Gainsborough. Uh, very beloved artist, uh, English artist. So at the top of the staircase, you're going to find some Dutch masters, uh, two pieces by Winslow Homer above the uh, cabinet that has the uh, Korean, uh, ancient Korean pieces. Former guest rooms on the second floor are now used as changing exhibit galleries, often featuring Wisconsin artists. Mr. Alice's bedroom has an entryway with a display of ancient terracotta and a painting by Blakelock who has been called the American Van Gogh. There's a bronze eagle from the American Pavilion at the Tokyo World's Fair in the 1890s. The other room is, was Miss Alice's bedroom. It's more of a gallery space now. You're going to see uh, changing, some changing exhibits in the cases, but of uh, particular note are the uh, Bruno Ernst watercolors that you'll find on the wall. Uh, most people think the butterflies and the insects and birds are specimens. They're so highly detailed and one really needs to pay attention to them. The museum director admits the Charles Alice Art Museum isn't as well known as others in the city. Uh, that's our fault. That's not the people of Milwaukee's fault. We have to do a better job of reaching out and inviting people to come in our doors and experience what it is that we have to offer and hopefully educate and entertain them. Uh, the Charles Alice here is in a tremendous urban neighborhood, an urban environment. We have to start locally in our neighborhoods and then grow out from there, but invite as many people, visitors and citizens of Milwaukee as we can. The idea that this is still standing in wonderful condition, it, it's not private, it's open to the public. It's the original collection, a lot of the homes, the original homes were gutted and they try to uh, refurnish. This is almost as you would have uh, seen when the Alice's lived here. This is uh, essentially their collection as they would like you to see it. You can come in, you can look at works of art, you can become yourself inspired, maybe you learn something about your world, your surroundings. But what this has in addition to that is the historical underpinning. Um, you can see how 
one of the elite of Milwaukee lived at the beginning of this century. As recent headlines showed, the epidemic that started only 20 years ago is still a major health issue. But that number is also seen as a positive sign. It's good news because people are living with HIV virus. Uh, the new therapies are allowing people to live longer. It means, however, there's a, more of a burden in terms of medical treatment. And it means that each of us may encounter more HIV-infected individuals in daily life, as usual, not knowing it. What is important is that we continue to stress prevention, because although medicines can prolong life, uh, nothing cures AIDS or HIV infection at this point. Prevention still relates back to some of the basic ideas of being uh, careful about sexual behavior, contact with blood products, use of intravenous needles, similar problems. Unlike many people with HIV or AIDS, Yolanda Cannon speaks publicly about her disease. Because I'm tired and there's too many people infected. There's too many young people infected. You know, we have a girl in our group, she just can't. She's 18 years old, you know, and it really hurts me because I know what she has to go through, you know. Yolanda comes from a family where drug use was common. A brother has died of AIDS. Another brother and two sisters are infected. Like many, she once thought it was a disease of gay white males. But a lot of them still think that. You know, I remember when I thought that way. You know, and I had to have show enough proof that it was a lie and show enough proof cost me my life. Yolanda also serves on the HIV Planning Council of the state of Wisconsin and is active in women's support groups. Her goal to convince kids to make better choices, to learn about the disease from those who are infected. We need to get those people out, the people that have AIDS or HIV, and let them come in and let these kids see that this stuff is no joke. You know, and a lot of times in the African neighborhood, if you don't see it, you don't believe it. Well, I believe now's the time for them to see it. They really don't understand. They really don't understand what disease do to your body. They really don't understand how much pain you be in. They really don't understand, you know, what, what AIDS means, you know. And to me, it is a death sentence. The problem is growing in the minority community. African Americans account for more than half of the estimated 40,000 new infections annually. In Wisconsin, they compose 28% of all AIDS cases and 32% of those infected with HIV. More African-American churches are now joining the fight. Six Milwaukee churches have received a $40,000 state grant to operate HIV counseling and testing sites. There is no medication that gets rid of the virus. A combination of many drugs is usually needed to help people deal with the illness and related diseases. Yolanda says people with HIV and AIDS need more than medical help. She hopes people will not turn away from those with the disease. We need help. We have people out here to turn back on their family and stuff. Where do they think these people are going to go? Who is going to help them? You know, in my support group, a lot of our girls say that this is the only family that we have. You know, my um, immune system, you know, is really low. <laughs> and I worry about that sometimes when I go out and give these talks to these kids. But I feel that it's so important that it's worth the risk. And then I put it all in God's hand. Because I feel, you know, these kids got to be made to understand. This, this can't go on. The AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin is an agency that provides social services to about 2,000 people. Health care, help finding housing, financial assistance, and dental care are among its services. The center says its AIDS library is the state's largest AIDS-specific information resource. 
Its information on the history, care, treatment, and prevention of the disease is available to the public. The rising HIV-infected population also brings mixed reactions here. Uh, you know, obviously we're worried about numbers uh, overall going up, numbers of AIDS infections across the country. Um, we're pleased that here in Wisconsin that's not the case. Uh, the state numbers that came out are a contrast to the national numbers because here in Wisconsin, between 2000 and 2001, AIDS, new AIDS infections, new HIV infections went down 14 percent. It's pretty stunning, um, uh, particularly because the previous year they had been up here slightly. Um, so I think it shows that um, uh, maybe we had a little scare in 2000, but in 2001 we went back to where we'd been throughout most of the 90s is declining infections. And um, uh, we're, we, we like to think that that's uh, at least in part because of the prevention work we do around the state. Last year, the state of Wisconsin reported 336 new cases of HIV infection, the lowest number since 1987. The Milwaukee Health Department focuses its efforts in several areas. The city has focused uh, its efforts in certain areas where other agencies may not. We help fund a variety of community-based agencies in getting the message out about HIV AIDS and making sure everybody understands the prevention message. In addition to that, we collaborate with the Medical College of Wisconsin on an AIDS intervention program that assists women uh, who have been diagnosed with uh, HIV or AIDS to get on the appropriate therapy and to deal with the many health and social issues that can affect them. In addition, the health department operates a special sexually transmitted disease clinic. More than 7,000 visits here a year. Detection and treatment of STDs is crucial since they can aid in the transmission of the HIV virus. Well, we are a free walk-in clinic, so basically our services are available to anyone who wants to utilize them. You don't necessarily have to be a city resident, but primarily we do serve city residents. Um, we offer walk-in sexually transmitted disease testing and treatment, and also um, testing for HIV. Our HIV testing is confidential testing, which means it is name associated, however, it is still confidential, which means no one really has access to the results but you. There is anonymous testing done by the City of Milwaukee Health Department. It's done at Southside Health Center. Some people come because they know that they've engaged in risky behaviors. Some people come because they're just what we call the worried well. You know, they've heard a lot about HIV. They may not necessarily be engaging in risk behaviors, but maybe they have in the past, or maybe they just want to be sure. What people don't realize is that if you're at risk for a sexually transmitted disease, you're at risk for HIV. They're transmitted the same way um, you know, we certainly know they're not diseases of poor hygiene of people who are dirty. You know, they're diseases of behavior. If you engage in risk behaviors, you put yourself at risk. I've had to give several positive HIV test results, and it varies greatly, you know, from person to person. But, you know, for most people, it's very devastating. Translated to the U.S. population, the latest estimates of infection means one of every 286 people has HIV. Health officials say many of them don't know it, aren't getting proper treatment, or both. HIV testing is important for one's own health so that one can get the appropriate treatment and also to preserve the health of others to make sure that the virus is not passed along. I don't know that people are so much afraid of testing as that people believe it can't happen to me or it won't happen to me. As fewer people die from AIDS, we hear less about AIDS, but it doesn't mean it's any less of a problem. They estimate that a third of people um, walking around out there who are positive don't even know it. And the only way to know is to get tested. And the earlier you get tested, the more likely you are to lead you know, a healthy, productive life. So I would absolutely encourage people to get tested. Well, I think we're cautiously hopeful. Um, I think that you always hope that it, from that medicine stays one step ahead of the virus because what we find is that the virus, you, uh, people develop resistance and they start to fail in the treatments and then you need new treatments. Um, so far, medically, we seem to be staying just one step ahead and we're being successful still in, in lengthening people's lives. You're looking for a cure? Are you hopeful that there'll be a cure soon? Yes, I'm hopeful. I hope so. I just hope it don't come too late.